All right. Good morning, everybody. We are we are actually live. Precal matters. One point one example one. Sweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, express each expression in the form b to the n, uh, such that uh, n is something. N is something. All right. So uh, reading the instructions is is kind of important, right? It's not like the manliest thing to do, right? You guys like to, I'm going to figure this out, right? All right, yeah, that was, a, that was a mushroom I should not have eaten. Okay, sorry, all right. Sometimes you get a chance to figure it out again. But when all else fails, if nothing else, if not in the very beginning, when all else fails, read the instructions. So on part A, I don't expect you to multiply those all out and go like 5 times 5 is uh, 25. 25 times 5 is, let's see if I have 5 quarters, I have a buck 25. So it's 125 and do that. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I want it to be some number, B, and of course we call B the what? The base, right? And it starts with B appropriately. And then N is the what? Exponent, right? Also known as the power. Good. And so remember what this means. That exponent tells you precisely how many of those B's you have what applied? Multiplied, good, multiplication. So exponentiation is actually shorthand multiplication. It tells you how many of those bases you're multiplying together, right? And this part here is red. We'll read this like this, where n, if you wanna write this down, is an element of, is an element of, and you remember what I said the capital N is? It's a group of numbers. Natural numbers. N is an element of the natural numbers. So whenever you see that like little curvy E, that's an epsilon right here. This is an epsilon. And it means is an element of or belongs to the family of. So the natural numbers, remember, start with one. They're also known as the counting numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? There are other number groups out there. Let's real quickly just talk about some of those, which is what you review pretty much on day one of any math course. If I take the natural numbers, the caveman picked up a rock and said, ooh, one rock, and then two rocks. They had no concept of what number until human greed kicked in. Zero. Zero. Very good. They didn't even know about rocks. They didn't. There wasn't a caveman walking around before they had rocks saying, me have zero rocks, bummer, right? They didn't know about rocks until they found them like, oh, rock, one rock, two rock. And now it's like, oh man, me now have zero rocks. So if you add zero to the natural numbers, you get another set of numbers. Does anyone know what it is? Unnatural. What if I told you it looked like that? It's a double bar W. It's this, it's the set, we use braces. This is called a brace. We use braces to denote sets. It's zero, one comma two comma three comma dot dot dot. It's an infinite set. It's the natural numbers, but with the zero there. What starts with W? What a burger. Are those the water burger numbers, sir? I wish, right? I could only have a shake from there right now because I'm still on liquid diet, I'm really good. Come on guys, what number group starts with W? You've had it. Whole numbers, thank you. Those are the whole numbers, okay? Now, um, once all the rocks were accounted for, the guy with zero rocks, or maybe the guy with 10 rocks, he needed to acquire more rocks, but they were all accounted for by somebody. So what do you do when you want more rocks and someone else has them, you what from them? You could trade for them, steal. or you could steal from them. Or legally, like in today's day and age, when you need money and you don't have it, you could steal it. You could trade for it, or you can loan it, loan it. Okay, you could borrow, and when you loan it, you owe it to them. What type of numbers are associated with owning or, or owing, sorry? Negatives, okay? So if I take this set of numbers and just look at the negative versions, dot, 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 negative three, negative two, negative one, comma zero, comma one, comma two, comma three, that goes to infinity now in both directions. That's basically the whole numbers with all the negative natural numbers. What number group is that? Is all review? Well, they are real numbers, okay? Every, everything we're talking about so far has been a real number. 
But um, there are real numbers that are not in this set, like square root of 2 is not in this set. 1 half is not in this set, and those are real numbers. The next largest set is integers. integers. Very good. These are the integers. Now, if natural numbers started with a capital N, right, and whole numbers were represented by a capital W, then it seems that integers should be represented by a capital what? I, right, but it's not. It's a capital Z, capital Z. So the integers are represented by Z. And you're like, oh, that's easy to remember because when I say integers, sometimes I, I have a little lisp in the front and I say zintegers, right? No, that's not real natural. Or when I say integers, what sound do I make at the end? Integer, z oh, there it is, integers, I got it. So why Z for integers? Anyone know? Because it's just the Greek alphabet. You are correct in that it's based off of a different language. I'll give you that. Okay? But not Greek. This should have come up like an Algebra 1. It should have come up in Algebra 2. Did it not? Latin's another great guess. We borrow a lot from Latin. Arabic is another great one. Where, where are all my German club members out here? Probably is peeps. Sprechen Sie sausage. There you go. Worst fest, sausage on the stick. Pictures of Coca-Cola. Yeah, yeah. What is the German verb to count? Anyone? German people? Germ. It probably starts with what letter? Z. It does. It's Zahlen. Z-A-H-L-E-N. Zahlen. German verb to count. So this one is not from Greek. This one is not from Latin. This is just like a little piece of trivia if you're ever on the Jeopardy show and the question comes up. Integer Z comes from the German verb Zahlen, which is to count, and that's why we use Z. Okay? Cool. Now, the next number set. Okay? Guys walking around cavemen, all these rocks. Can't hold them all. What happens? Rock fall? Rock break. Uh-oh. Me no have one rock now. Me have what? Parts of rock, halves, two-thirds, okay? So when we add fractions to these guys, like 0.5 is also a fraction, isn't it? Because it's one-half. If we add the terminating or repeating decimals, one-third is 0.333 forever. If we add all the fractions, we take all of these numbers, because you can put these over one, and then we add all the other ones, um, we get uh, the set of numbers that are like this. It's the set of numbers, we'll say it's the form P over Q, such that P and Q are integers. Ooh, look at that. Let's talk about sets real quick, okay? And again, this is review, which means we're reviewing again, right? When you look at the two versions I did at the top for the whole numbers and the integers, that's called roster notation. Have you all heard that? Roster notation, like a team roster, right? Hey, who's playing tonight, coach? Well, here's the roster. It's this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, comma, dot, 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 right? We got infinitely many players out there today. That's a roster. You're listing them. This one right here, we can't list in roster notation because as soon as we try to list them, we're going to skip some. There's no way to, like, order it. So this is called set builder notation. Have you heard that? Set builder notation. We're now reading this a little bit differently. This is the set of all things of the form P over Q. And now I have to say what P and Q are. So this vertical line, we read it as such that. Okay? This we read as such that. P and Q belong to what family? Integers. So like 1 over 2, negative 3 over 5. Right? Every whole number is also in this group, right? Because you could write this as 3 over 1. You could write this as negative 2 over 1. Okay, does anyone know what we call those numbers that are fractions, essentially, terminating or repeating decimals? Radical? What? If we say that we're taking P2Q, if we read it like that, P2Q, that means we're reading this as a ratio, right? P to Q. So this is going to be rational numbers. Yeah, these are rational numbers. And the key word in rational is not al at the end. What's up, al? No, it's ratio. It's ratio. 
Now, do you think we use R, double bar R, to represent the rational numbers? That is, do you think we use this to represent rational numbers? No, because y'all recognize that guy as the, this is all real numbers. Yeah, that's a bigger set that we haven't gotten to yet. By default, by the way, if I don't specify what number group we're using this year, it's the set of real numbers, okay? So we can't use R. So let's think of another letter that's appropriate. When you take a dividend and you divide it by a divisor, the result is called a what? A quotient, right? Something times something is a product, but something divided by something is a quotient. So, guess what letter we use? Q. Q. And I just put like a double stem on it like that. Quotient. They're ratios. All right. Now, um, that's kind of the biggest one we can define, but there are also numbers you know that are irrational. Irrational numbers are numbers that can't be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Can anyone give me an example of an irrational number? Pi. Pi. Excellent. Any non-repeating, non-terminating decimal, like pi. There are computers right now that are still calculating the decimal digits in pi. And we have volumes and volumes and volumes of decimal digits. They're like on volume 5 million right now. You go to volume one, you turn the first page, it says three point, and then you turn the page, and it's one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just rows and rows of numbers, and you're like, oh, interesting. And then you turn the page, and there's just more numbers. And there's computers still calculating them. It's a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. Now, that's called a transcendental irrational number. You don't need to know that. But pi cannot be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Archimedes, the guy in the blue poster over there, he bounded pi between... Uh, those two numbers right there, 3 and 10 70ths and 3 and 10 71st. That's what gives you your 22 over 7. Did you all ever have that as an approximation of pi? In one of your classes, they said, whenever pi comes up, just use 3.14 or 22 over 7. Yeah, 22 over 7 was courtesy of Archimedes. Pretty dang close, okay? So pi is a famous one. Another irrational number that you're going to meet this year is the letter E. E the number, though. Not E, uh, the, the letter. Phi. Have y'all heard of that number, phi? Have y'all heard of the golden ratio? Yeah, the golden ratio is an irrational number. It's represented by the letter phi. It's 1.618. And that's the ratio of like width to height, or height to width, sorry. And that's supposed to be uh, the most physically pleasing for us to look at, right? People whose face follows the golden ratio. It's just like, oh, I can look at that all day long, right? It's pretty, okay? So square root of two is another irrational number. That's an algebraic irrational number. Square root of two has a quite a bit of story behind it, which I'll tell you at a later date. Square root of two actually conquered the uh, Pythagoreans. So we call it rational and irrational numbers. There's no overlapping. We call those two sets what? If the two sets don't overlap, remember what we call them? They are mutually exclusive when there's no overlapping we call them mutually exclusive or disjoint the same thing there's no overlapping now when we take the mutually exclusive groups of rational numbers those numbers that can be written as ratio which includes every number before it and terminating repeating decimals like a third and a half and we combine them with all the irrational numbers that cannot be expressed as a ratio like pi, e, phi, square root of 2, square root of 5, et cetera, et cetera, we get the number group known as the, anyone, anyone? Reals. Reals. Good. So that's what we're going to be using as our default number group this year, the set of real numbers. Unless I specify otherwise, we're going to be looking at what types of numbers? Reals. Now, you can also introduce from here, go up a step, and introduce the imaginary unit and start talking about complex numbers. But... We're not going to do that, okay? So anyway, uh, n has to be, in this case, the set of natural numbers. So uh, from the very beginning, we're on 1a. From the very beginning, as you take notes, or you're doing a quiz or a test, you want to establish good habits. This is an expression. We need to work straight down. That's how you work with expressions. And every line that follows underneath that 
which is your project, quote unquote, has to be equivalent to every other line, okay? So in this case, you have a bunch of fives multiplied together, and now you just count them up. How many are there? Six, and so that's it. That's all we do. There's six fives multiplied together, so I'm gonna write that as five to the sixth power. Pretty easy, yep, pretty easy. Um, yeah, that's it. You do not need to put an equal sign there, okay? If you work straight down with an expression, we know it's the same as the one above, you're done. Now you could put over here, if you wanted, you could say that equals five to the sixth. And that would not be incorrect, but if there's more than one step, you do not want to work left to right. That's not how we do math from left to right. We work vertically, okay? So I would not really like, I would prefer this right here, okay? Cool. Is the top line equal to the bottom line? Mm -hmm. Is the bottom line equal to the top line? Mm -hmm. So we be done. All right. Any questions on that? Letter B. All right. You already did this one. Uh, I got a bunch of one halves. It looks like multiplied together. So uh, what operation is implied right here when you have two parentheses side by side? Multiplication. multiplication. Okay. That's implicit multiplication. We don't use the letter X anymore for multiplication, do we? Why? Not. You have the variable x, and that would be very confusing. So don't use the x anymore for multiplication. We use dots, which sometimes stand out nicely, like in part A. Uh, but parentheses really work well, OK? Parentheses are your best friends in a math class. It's better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. So um, all you have to do is then say, OK, this is going to be, it uh, looks like the base is 1 half. And all I got to do is count out how many I have. So what do I do with the exponents when the bases are the same? I add them, right? Because remember, the exponent is just telling you how many of these you got multiplied together. I got two of these multiplied together times another seven of those guys multiplied together. Okay, times what? Four. Another one. Okay, so for a total of what? Ten. Ten. Now, two points I want to make here. I'm going to leave it like that. But first of all, if you are in the heat of the moment, that is, you're taking a quiz, you're taking a test, and the clock is ticking. Tick-tock goes the clock, right? Remember that book when you were young? No? Okay. You know that the implied exponent right here is a what? There's supposed to be a 1 there, okay? You know that. But in haste, your eyes will betray you. You know you're adding exponents. You're like, oh, I got a base of 1 half. I see a 2. I see a 7. 2 plus 7 is 9. Boom, you put a 9 there. And what happens? You get it wrong. Is it because you didn't know how to do the problem? No, it's because haste makes what? Waste. So you'll hear me say a lot of things repeatedly in this class. One of them is inch by inch, it's a cinch. As we work down, we're going to do one little step at a time and just work towards the final answer. But in this case, I'm going to say, help yourself, help yourself. Help yourself, help yourself. What do I mean by that? If you know there's an implied one there, Go ahead and put a 1 in there, because now you see that every base has an associated exponent, and you're less likely to make what kind of mistake? Careless mistake. Don't say stupid mistake, because it's not a stupid mistake. It's a careless mistake. Can you fix stupid? No. Probably not. But can you fix careless? Yes, by being what? Care full, full of care instead of less of care. Yeah. Okay. So that's that point. Now, if you were the teacher and I turned that in and you looked at that, would you be smiling? Would you be happy with my final answer? Ah, very good. Is that exponent of 10 associated with the one or the two or the horizontal line or both? Both. Both. Okay. So that is ambiguous. We don't do that. It's a fraction, so we write it like this. That's your final answer, okay? Now, could you write it as 0 0.5 to the 10th power without parentheses? Sure, because 0 0.5 and 1 half are what? The same. Now, could you just write it as 0 0.5 to the 10th? Yes. Do you need that 0 in front? No. I prefer to have it because otherwise the decimal looks like a stray dot. But when the 0 is in front, it's a very deliberate choice, okay? Now, you're not going to be able to do that with all fractions, right? If it were, let's look at this off to the side. If the answer were 1 third to the 10th, could you just write that as 0.333 to the 10th? 
No. Okay. Why not? Yeah. These are no longer equivalent. Unless you plan on writing infinitely many threes, which one is more accurate, the top one or the bottom one? The top one. Right? So we want to try to think in terms of fractions, not decimals. Now, you could do this, right? 0.3 with the bar over it to the 10th power. When was the last time you wrote a bar over a number? The last time I did it was just like two seconds ago to illustrate that you don't want to do it that way. It's like using a multiplication symbol for x. 2 times 3 equals box. Remember those worksheets? We're way past that. We don't put lines over numbers, okay? We just say as accurate as we can be, it's the quantity one third to the tenth power, okay? That one good so far? Are we learning more than just math? Yeah, we are learning how to communicate math, how to present math. All right. All right, letter C. Oh boy. Oh boy. How many terms do you see up there in this expression? Let's talk about terms and factors. Super important. Terms, bless you, Thank you. versus factors. Okay? Like they're having like a dance off or something. Terms are separated by plus and minus signs. Factors are separated by what? Multiplication or division signs. Okay? Huge difference. How many terms do you see in this expression on part C? Zero. Not quite zero. Slightly bigger than that. One. one. Yeah. This whole thing is one term. If I said all of that plus one, now how many terms do we see? Two. Two. The big gigantic one and the number one. Okay, but there's no plus one there. So that's just one term. Now, how many factor groups do we see here? Three factor groups are the most visible. Yeah, three factor groups. So when we're trying to simplify, we're trying to have as little amount of stuff in our final answer as possible, okay? So here's what I would say. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Which one of those factor groups look the most appetizing? The middle one, right? If you're hungry, you're going after the middle one, right? It's like a Big Mac, although Big Macs aren't really big anymore, right? Unless you wait for the big Big Mac to come out, which is only for a limited time. This is the one I'm going to focus on, okay? This one. Now, that is three raised to the tooth power, right? Or second power. Yeah, same thing. What do I do with those numbers? You multiply them together. Very good. Because remember, the outer two tells you that you have two of these factors. So you have that to the third times that to the third. And three plus three is six. So here's what's cool about rules of exponents. They always come down one rung on the operational ladder. On the bottom rung, you have addition and subtraction. You go up rung, you got multiplication and division. You go up another rung, you have exponentiation and square roots, fourth roots, and all that good stuff. So notice over here, this was multiplication, right? We were multiplying. We were multiplying. The bases were the same. We were multiplying. And what did we do with the exponents? We added them. It came down one rung on the operational ladder. Over here, this is a power raised to a power. This is called exponentiation. What do we do with those? We multiply them. It comes down one rung on the operational ladder. So let's go ahead and multiply them. Negative 3.1. 3 times 2, don't mess up, don't mess up, 6. Boom. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and focus on the other stuff. I'm just going to bring it down. This is where inch by inch, it's a cinch. If the problem looks gigantic, just focus on one little part at a time. Now, a couple of things here. You eat an elephant one tiny bite at a time. Okay, that's what we're doing here. We're eating an elephant one tiny bite at a time. I just brought the left factor down and the right factor down, and I took a little bite out of the middle one, okay? You don't eat an elephant in one big bite. What happens if you do that? You choke, and you probably dislocate your jaw, right? Getting the elephant in there. 
You eat an elephant one little tiny bite at a time. How do you eat an elephant, everybody? One tiny bite at a time. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Okay? All right, cool. Now, here's the other thing. Notice the pink factor on the left and right. If you were working this problem and you did that, and then on the next line you started writing stuff, would I be happy? No, because you're working straight down. And is this factor by itself equivalent to the line above it? No. So this is your project. You have the obligation when you're working straight down, number one, not to interrupt the flow of the problem. You can go off to the side and do bench work and bring it back in, but you also have the obligation of bringing everything down that you're not working on so that it remains equivalent. Now, I'll be a little bit lenient here in the first few weeks, but this is the expectation I have for you. So that's part of what you're learning. Communicate correctly. Work straight down. Okay. Now, I can only combine those if the bases are the same. Let's work from right to left. What's the base of the number five, everybody? On the far right, what's the base of the five? Negative 3.1. Everyone good on that? Pretty easy. Working back to the left, what is the base on the exponent 6? Negative 3.1. Are those the same base? Yes, so I can combine their exponents. Moving over to the far left, what is the base on the 4, everybody? What kind of 3.1? Really? No, thank you. Why is it not negative 3.1? It's not in parentheses. Do you see how these other guys were in parentheses? This one is not in parentheses. So there was like a little math problem floating around the internet all summer long, and it like broke the internet one day, like Kim Kardashian's photo did that time, okay? And people were like commenting like, the answer is 16. No, it's one, you stupid. No, it's 16, you dummy PEMDAS. And it's like, no, only one of you is right. And it came down to basically this issue, okay? The parentheses are super important. Let's go off to the side. When you have negative 3.1 to the fourth, that is the same as negative 1 times 3.1 to the fourth, okay? The exponent is only associated with the base that is immediately to the left. If you want that exponent to be included in other factors, whether it's an explicit or an implicit factor like negative one, you need parentheses, okay? So that's a careless mistake. You want to avoid careless mistakes. I show you how to do things, but I also point out the common errors so that you can what? Avoid them, All right? So let's, Let's go ahead and combine these fellas, because I can, right? That's going to be the quantity, negative 3.1 to the what? 30th or 11th or peaches power? 11th. We add them, right? Now, the next one, this one here, when I bring it down, I am going to help myself, help myself. I'm going to write that as negative 1 to the 3.1 to the 4th power. See that? That's negative 1 times 3.1 to the 4th. I added parentheses to help separate them. Okay, now I'm re-inventorying. Do I have the bases the same there? No. So can I combine those exponents? No. No. It's like having bananas and plantains. Are they the same? No. Are they very similar? Yeah, but they're not the same. Now, here's where the magic happens, your little mathematical uh, manipulation. Is there a way to manipulate these so that the bases are the same? Can anyone think of a way? This is where you start thinking instead of just like, I am copying today, sir. This is where you're engaging your brain, you're thinking. This is like we've run into a little obstacle here. And mathematicians learn how to cleverly circumvent problems right if we have a brick wall that's like five feet wide in front of us and we're trying to get to the other side we're not just walking into it constantly hoping the brick wall moves we're not trying to push the brick wall over we're not trying to climb over the brick wall 
we just take a step back and say, ah, oh, okay. All right. Good luck, dudes. We go around it. How can we combine those? What can we do? Someone last period said, can you just multiply it by negative one? And I was like, just multiply it? In math class, we don't just do things. Everything we do is very thought out and deliberate, right? Nike would not be a good sponsor for us. If we just multiply by negative one, does that change the value of this expression? Yeah. yeah. Can we do that? No. Everything has to be equivalent. So let's quickly go over what is legal. What can we do? It needs to be the same. It has to be equal all the way down. We can always multiply by a clever form of what number and have the same answer? One. One, right? Because anything times one is what? Itself, right? Anything times one is itself, right? Five times one is five. Peaches times one is peaches. Okay, good. So should I just multiply by like seven over seven? That would be legal, right? But would it be helpful? No. Okay. I can also add a clever form of what? Zero. Because anything plus zero is? There you go. Redemption itself, whatever it was before. That's what you do when you complete the square. I don't know if you knew that. You were adding a clever form of zero, plus five minus five. That's zero. But then you're associating them differently. Um, we can also, you know, divide out common factors, combine like terms. Let's take a look at this right here. Let's look at negative three point one to the eleventh power. Is, and I'm off to the side here, okay, bench work. Is this answer going to be a positive or a negative number? Negative. It's going to be a negative number. Why so? Because it has an odd exponent. Yes. That is an odd exponent. So remember, when you square a negative number, that is when you pair up two negative factors, a negative times a negative is a what? Positive. A positive. So if you take pairs of negative factors, they're going to end up being a positive number. So if I have 11, I could pair five of them up, right? And I got positive times positive times positive times positive times positive. And then who's left over? A negative 3.1 factor. And what's a positive times a negative? A negative. So I know that that answer is going to be a negative number. So can I drop the parentheses? and write it like that and still be correct. In other words, are these two equal? Yes, but that's not always true, right? It's only true because this is what type of exponent? Odd, because that line, remember, is the same as negative one times 3.1 to the 11th. Yes, yes? Okay, all right. So. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write the quantity negative 3.1 to the fifth, or in this case to the eleventh. I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to help myself, help myself. So I'm going to import that back into the project. I'm going to have a negative 1 times the 3.1 to the fourth times a negative 1 times the 3.1 to the eleventh. And notice when I brought it back in, I went down to a new line. Here's the project over here. Take inventory. Is, are any two lines in this thing working down still equal to each other? Are any two of these lines still equal to each other? Yes. If that's not the case on your paper, you're going to lose points. Okay. Now, I could do this. Look at this. What is negative 1 times negative 1? Positive 1. What property of multiplication allows me to multiply those two fellas together, even though they're not side by side? What property allows me to associate those two factors together? What property of multiplication allows me to, you got this, Ty, associate those two property factors together? Associate those two factors together? The associative property of multiplication. Seguro. All right. So because negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1, do I even need to write a positive 1 down? No, because I'm multiplying. You can, but you don't have to. So 
Now look what's left. Now look what's left. I got a 3.1 to the fourth times a 3.1 to the 11. Now are the bases the same? Orale, yes, they are. So now I can write it as 3.1 to the what? 44th power? Oh, don't do that, right? You fall at the end. It's 4 plus 11. It's the 15th power. Now, that's one way to write it. Can I write it like this? Yes. Okay, so that's considered more simplified because it has less stuff. All right? So that's the answer. All right, now, let's look at this. If this were negative 3.1, let's say, to the 52nd power, just, just like we'll call this a bonus idea. Okay, if it was an odd exponent, I know it's going to be a negative number. I could pull the negative out. But what if it's negative 3.1 to the 52nd power, where 52 is what type of number? Even. Is that answer going to be positive or negative? It's going to be positive. So I can just drop the negative altogether, can't I? Yes. Very important. When you have groups, quantities, in parentheses, to an odd power, you can drop the parentheses because your answer is going to be negative. But if you have a negative quantity to an even power, what do you do with negativity in that case? Get rid of it. Hashtag Rachel's challenge. Get rid of that negativity. Okay? And that's a great place to stop for today. Are we learning more than math? Heck yeah, we're learning how to communicate it. Okay? Now, if you want to watch this lesson again, I'm recording it right now. Where can you go? Corpy's World. It's going to be in the shared folder. Have a great day when the bell might ring.